this week on the Back Table Podcast. To your point, we'll never have a randomized control trial for pregnancy. We're never going to have a randomized control trial for pediatrics. We're never going to have a randomized control trial for individual developmental disabilities, for example. You're never going to have a randomized control trial for nonagenarians. It's just not going to happen. It's very, very hard to design a trial like that. I used to be very judgmental. As a resident, I'd read these trials. We'd have Journal Club. I'm like, but they include excluded these patients. And, and now I know why that this was done. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. For those physicians treating wide-necked bifurcation brain aneurysms, the web intrasacular device has been proven and widely utilized solution for many years. Recently, Webcast and Webcast 2 were published confirming safety and efficacy at five-year follow-ups. Over the five years of the study, the web device demonstrated long-term stability and durability, as well as an adequate aneurysm occlusion rate of 77.9% and 0% web-related mortality or morbidity. For more information on the web device and the recent clinical data, reach out to your microvention sales representative. For complete indications, contraindications, potential complications, warnings, precautions, and instructions, see instructions for use provided in the device. The web device should only be used by physicians who have undergone training in all aspects of the web system procedures as prescribed by microvention. Web is intended for healthcare professional use only and by prescription only. Now, back to the episode. Hello, everyone. My name is Krishna Almolero. I'm a neurointerventional radiologist practicing with Goodman Campbell Brain and Spine in Indianapolis, Indiana. I have been invited to be a special guest host this week for The Back Table. Today, we are going to be talking to Dr. Fawaz al-Mufti about endovascular thrombectomy for acute ischemic stroke in special populations, uh, specifically populations that were excluded from the large randomized control trials that we all have come to know and experience in terms of patient selection. He is an associate professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and radiology at New York Medical College and Westchester Medical Center in Valhalla. He is the director of the Neuroendovascular Surgery Fellowship. He's the director of the Neurocritical Care Unit. Uh, he is the assistant dean for graduate medical education research. He's the vice chair of neurology research. So Fawaz, again, thank you for joining us. To start out, what defines a special population and why is it important for us to uh, know how to treat these patients specifically in the realm of stroke thrombectomy? Krishna, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be on the Backtable podcast. Overall, I would say what defines a special population is like, in my mind, these are patients who are typically excluded from the randomized controlled trials that exist to essentially prove the benefit of a particular intervention. However, those are patients that have been excluded for whatever reason. Uh, this has become the focus of my career over the past like five to six years. I've just dedicated a lot of my time and effort to studying them on a, and dedicate a lot of my research to studying these patients. These include patients like pregnant patients, uh, pediatric patients, octogenarians, nonagenarians, patients like in their hundreds even patients with dementia, patients with developmental disabilities, patients with medical comorbidities like congestive or end-stage heart failure, liver failure, renal failure. Those are patients that are excluded from the general population studied in randomized control trials because think about it for a second. Randomized control trials are designed to demonstrate a efficacy of a particular intervention. They kind of are designed in a way to make sure that they're successful at the same time. Sure. And it's uh, interesting that you talk about those certain populations. And I think for today, uh, we're going to try to at least focus on the octogenarian, nonagenarian population, the pediatric population, and the pregnancy population, uh, simply because I think on a daily clinical basis, um, those are the patient populations that we most frequently run into. Now, when you talk about these large randomized controlled trials, you know, just for the audience, can you remind us about which trials you're referring to, specifically the landmark trials of 2015 to 2017. And some of them did actually did have different qualification metrics. For example, oxygenarians, non-Nigerians, you know, certain trials had a maximum age of 80 or 85 or, or 90 in certain situations. But can you just 
kind of briefly go through which trials that you're specifically referring to in which these patients were excluded? Yeah, of course. So 2015 was a very special year for the field of neurointerventional surgery. Because prior to that, we basically had very little data or high quality data supporting the use of mechanical thrombectomy for the treatment of large vessel occlusion ischemic strokes. But we're very fortunate to have had almost six back-to-back randomized controlled trials that came out in 2015, in large part in response to a a trial that came out in 2013, which was the IMS-3, that demonstrated lack of harm, but no clear benefit. And that basically... That trial in particular was a blessing in disguise because it allowed the field to come together to rally behind each other and defend our patients. So there were Mr. Clean, Revascat, Extend IA, Escape trials and others that all came out around 2015 to early 2016, demonstrating the benefit of mechanical thrombectomy. Ultimately, the, many of these trials were included in something called the Hermes Registry, which includes data from almost all of these patients. Now, to your point, some of these trials did include patients in their 80s and did include patients in their, like in their 70s and in their 80s. But overall, the data that we have for onoctogenarians, onogenarians is very, very limited. And that's important also for the general population. And for example, a practicing neurointerventionalist in the community who really abides by the strict guidelines of the American Heart Association or American Stroke Association. And to be honest, when a patient who's excluded from these trials uh, hits their doorstep, it's hard for them to know what to do with these populations. So I think that's the utility of, of the conversation today. And maybe we'll start with the octogenarians, nonagerians. And again, these are patients in their 80s and 90s. And we can even talk about patients in their hundreds right now in terms of how to treat these patients uh, when they come on to our doorstep. In the first couple slides of many talks right now, you'll always see a slide of something along the lines of, you know, a large vessel occlusion stroke is is increasing rapidly and most predominantly in the elderly population. What is your approach when you see a patient in their 80s and 90s coming into the ER and how do you approach that versus a 40 or 50 year old uh, with a large vessel occlusion? Do you do anything differently mentally or emotionally? A very important thing to think about is like what defines an elderly person. And like Mm -hmm. just the other day, my colleague of mine and I were discussing like age is relative, right? Um, If a person is five years older than I am, that's considered old as far as I'm concerned. When I was in my 20s, a person who was a 30 year old was old, older than me. But by definition, anybody above the age of 65 is considered elderly. And due to improvement in healthcare and better standards of living, elderly individuals, older than 65 years of age, are expected to double by the year 2050. 30% of ischemic strokes occur in patients within this age group, and it's associated with a particularly poor clinical outcome, yeah. approximately almost 60 to 70%, despite optimal and like good recanalization rate, almost 80% recanalization rate. We have several retrospective and prospective observational studies that have reported mechanical thrombectomy for elderly individuals. But the generalizability of these studies is limited by small sample size, restriction to a single center, significant heterogeneity, and often without comparison to optimal best medical management. In 2016, the trial investigators collectively pulled the data into a collaboration from Mr. Clean, Escape, or Vascat, Swift Prime, and Extend IA into the Hermes registry. Hermes basically stands for the highly effective reperfusion evaluated in multiple endovascular stroke trials. And when you actually look at Hermes, a very small percent proportion of patients in Hermes included elderly individuals between Mm -hmm. 60 and 85. Swift Prime did include individuals more than age 80, and Revascat excluded anyone above the age of 85. So in this meta-analysis of Hermes trial showed better 90-day outcome amongst patients aged more than 80 years of age with thrombectomy than patients treated with intravenous TPA alone. And that was like, almost like 30% versus 13%. Patients were three times more likely to have a better outcome. Additionally, elderly individuals who underwent mechanical thrombectomy had a slightly reduced risk of death, 30% versus 45%, and an adjusted odds ratio of like 0.6. Uh-huh. So do you take those, do you, I mean, do you take those data points into consideration when you, when you are evaluating your, your own 80 and 90 year old patients? Do you, is that something that you consciously think about or is it as you had said, you know, age is relative. 
when I first started doing this, I, I was very careful not to go against the guidelines. And then as we started to see relatively healthy 70-year-olds and 80-year-olds, it just became more. And I started doing thrombectomies on these patients. I started seeing good outcome. Now, not every 80-year-old is going to do very well. They're less likely to do uh, as well as a person in their 50s and their 60s. Uh, however, not infrequently, you're going to see a patient in their 80s who may be healthier than a 60-year-old with heart disease, cabbage, and renal failure, and liver failure. And the 80-year-old may be actually healthier. So I think you just have to take age with a grain of salt and be prepared that they may not necessarily do as well. I usually have this discussion with, if I'm able to, I'll have that discussion with a patient. Otherwise, I'll always have this discussion with the family. My oldest patient was probably 103 years old. Th that patient did well. I'll never forget a 99-year-old that I, I did a thrombectomy on six years ago, and I still see this patient in clinic. And uh, I hear from her family members frequently thanking me because like that this is like she was a Holocaust survivor and uh, they're extremely grateful because this patient did remarkably well. Fantastic. So the goalposts for these large trials involved in the in the Hermes uh, meta-analysis data, you know, has always been modified Rankin score of zero, one or two. And it's interesting. I think one thing that I try to think about in extremely elderly patients is the ability to avoid an MRS of five. And that's something that you and I have talked about in a, in a recent SWIN webinar on the large core trials and the uh, magnet meta analysis and the Tesla 2 trial. And one of the things for the audience to recognize is elderly patients might actually present with much more commonality of uh, presenting with a large core bed of uh, infarction compared to a younger patient population. And one of the things I try to think about is the last thing we want to do is take an 80 or 90 year old and turn an MRS of six into an MRS of five. That is, to be honest, the, the worst case scenario, not only from a societal viewpoint, but also a, a family viewpoint as well. And one thing that I really try to consider is, am I going to do that in an 80 or a 90 year old? Am I going to turn a patient into a very difficult outcome for the family to manage? And I think that is one of the goalposts that I try to keep in mind. I just, so rather than trying to achieve a modified Rankin score of zero, one, or two, my main goal actually in oxygenarians and non is actually my main goal is to avoid an MRS of five, which is, uh, you know, a significant disability uh, requiring a, a very high level, level of care. So I think that's one thing that I try to do uh, in my own practice rather than trying to achieve reperfusion and a, and a great outcome. And the second thing that you had kind of alluded to is this concept of futile recanalization. And I'd kind of like to pick your brain a little bit about that. And futile, futile recanalization is basically the entity of we get a tiki 2 b or a 3 recanalization, and yet for whatever reason, those patients end up doing very poorly, despite all objective measures being similar to a younger patient. So let's say, you know, a good time from symptom uh, onset to recanalization a one-pass recanalization at TK3, and by all objective measures, that patient should have done well, and yet for whatever reason, they do poorly, and uh, you know, objectively, maybe it's perhaps just due to their, to their age. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about what do we know about risk factors for futile recanalization and why you think perhaps that oxygenarians and non-agerians are, are more prone to, to this phenomenon? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And it kind of ties in with your earlier comment regarding just trying your our level best to avoid a very poor outcome or converting an, a modified ranking of six, a person who is who would have norm, like otherwise died into an MRS of five where they're bedridden, trached, pegged in a nursing home for the rest of their, their lives. I would say in those cases, I always factor in the clinical image, like clinical scenario, how they, they're manifesting clinically. And I compare that to what the radiographic imaging demonstrates. And if there is a clear clinical radiographic disconnect where the amount of damage the brain has already sustained is significant, I will always have that conversation with the family. If I see that the basal ganglia or the caudate head, like that, the, the deeper ganglionic structures are all infarcted, but there's clearly some cortical tissue that I'm going to salvage. Though that might be a discussion that I'll have with the family and say, you know, I doubt that this patient, they may not necessarily regain their ability to ambulate. And if that is not in line with their wishes, 
then maybe we would reconsider. This would be a discussion I would probably have with uh, a 90 year old or a person in their hundreds, because I know that they're not going to, they may not necessarily have the stamina. They're probably going to be more frail than a person in their 60s who's going to under, be able to undergo aggressive physical therapy for the next three months to regain the, their ability to ambulate. The octogenarian or nonagenarian may not necessarily have that ability or necessarily even have that time. A lot of their comorbidities actually start to catch up with them, especially if the hospitalization course gets prolonged. With regards to your question on regarding futile recanalization, I mean, I wish there's a way for us to predict who will have a futile recanalization. We know that it's not a matter of like the number of passes. In the past, I mean, we all strive for a first pass effect, but there are definitely other studies that looked at how many passes do you have to continue to perform before achieving good outcome, after which there's a, a limitation as far as like any potential benefit and just an increase in risk of harm. In those patients, even in those cases, we found that there really wasn't a significant, like a particular number of passes beyond which you're more likely to cause harm than good. In my, I always struggle with this. I'm like, ah, should I stop after three passes? Should I stop after five passes? What is the maximum number of passes you should attempt on a patient? And I believe in that one, in that one study, they went up to like five passes and there was no significant difference in outcomes between those patients and the patients who had uh, a first pass effect. Now, that was not in patients uh, who were octogenarians and nonagenarians. And you and I both know those are much more challenging cases because their aortic arch is more difficult. There's a lot of atherosclerotic disease all over the body. So access will definitely be like a significant issue. I start to suspect futile recanalization when I see an early draining vein, for example, like on my super selective run. This tells me that yeah, I'm probably going to have a no reflow phenomena where you open the bl 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 blood vessel, but there's already so much damaged tissue. There's a very rapid shunting of the blood from the artery, arteriolar phase, like in, into the capillary, venular, and the venous phase, so rapid that it's not really, the blood is not being truly perfusing the brain. It's all being shunted. That's a case where I would suspect futile recanalization, but I, I generally don't stop. And it's not something like I've learned not to factor that into my initial decision because I never know until, until I've already done it. Now, when these patients actually do, like after the thrombectomy, I always make sure that the families know very well that it's only a minority of patients that have this Lazarus effect where they get better within 24 hours. I always say the trials showed us that at 90 days, after aggressive physical therapy, they will more likely than not reach optimal, their, what they're going to look like, or, or very close to what they're going to look like down the road or much longer down the road. So I kind of prepare my patients before that uh, and their families before that, not to expect a miracle like on day one. Now, we do know now that in some cases that does translate to what they're going to look like later on. But having seen these patients come to me in clinic afterwards, I know that there is con constant improvement after the thrombectomy over the next three to six months. You had mentioned this concept of a radiographic clinical mismatch and, and how you take that into effect specifically with elderly patients. One of the other things that I have, I have started to do is actually look at the burden of white matter disease. And there has been a decent amount of research or data on this topic. And there are certain scoring systems for periventricular white matter disease, like the Fizika uh, scoring system. Um, but that is one thing that I, I have started, to, at least anecdotally, to do in my own practice, which is just kind of taking a look. I mean, all these patients are going to have non-contrast CT. Sometimes they do have old MRIs just after, you know, living on this planet for 90 years. If I have a chance to look at the burden of white matter disease, and we, we know that periventricular white matter disease is actually a, maybe even an independent prognosticator for poor outcome. And uh, in patients who have high physica scores, so a lot of periventricular confluent white matter disease in the deep basal ganglia and in the subcortical uh, white matter, you know, those patients do not end up doing well. So, you know, that is uh, something perhaps for the audience to kind of keep in the back of their minds. There are other radiographic correlates of prognostication for, for poor outcome. Um, but uh, let's move on to another population here. Let's go on to the pediatric population. 
always a, uh, a scary entity to uh, come across a pediatric case with a large vessel occlusion and, and how to approach uh, such patients. Let's start off with thrombolytic, systemic thrombolytics in, in pediatric patients, specifically TPA. From the front lines, what is your approach of TPA in pediatric patients? And, and what do you think are some of the roadblocks to um, systemic thrombolysis in, in pediatric stroke? That's a great question, Krishna. And as you know, Pediatric stroke is extremely rare. It's definitely rarer than, uh, than, than what we see with adults. I think the last paper I saw was like almost 2.3 per 100,000 children. But the, we know that the effects can be devastating uh, with a very high morbidity, almost 70%. And fortunately, a lower mortality than what we see with adults, uh, but approximately 3% mortality. Still high for a child. With regards to TPA, unfortunately, TPA is not FDA approved for children. Alteplase and tenecteplase, as an example, has not been approved for neither children or adults. We know that it's been it's been approved for like cardiac thrombosis, but definitely not approved for stroke in general. That being said, we do use alteplase. We do perform mechanical thrombectomy despite the huge lack of data because we know that the natural history of this condition can be pretty devastating. And we also know that we, we have to extrapolate data from adults to children, especially when you have like larger children. Sure. And this kind of highlights the difficulty of performing randomized trials in these special populations. The, the TIPS trial w was an attempt at a randomized trial for thrombolytics in children, and it failed for multiple reasons, one of which, you know, a lot of these patients were being screened. I think 93 patients were screened, only one uh, of whom was enrolled. A lot of these kids were coming in uh, with multiple contraindications to uh, thrombolytics and with alternative diagnoses. So running a randomized controlled trial for even something uh, like TPA is, is very difficult. And therefore, you know, having a randomized controlled trial for thrombectomy in a population like pediatrics, to be honest, uh, I think you and I both know it will probably never happen. It will be almost impossible at this point to achieve equipoise in randomization of a child towards medical management in an entity which we know has unbelievable success in the adult population. So, you know, having a randomized controlled trial for thrombolytic was very challenging. And honestly, uh, you know, having a, a randomized control trial for thrombectomy in pediatric patients will also, you know, likely never happen. So knowing that, and, and you had mentioned this before, you know, stroke in children is, is extremely rare. A lot of these times these kids are showing up to the ER and, and with focal neurologic deficits, the, the, the first thing most practitioners jump to is some type of uh, infectious or inflammatory process, uh, a seizure disorder. You know, stroke is usually not the first thing that people jump to. And even within that category, inflammatory etiologies for stroke are far, far more common than cardioembolic etiologies. Let's just talk about that specifically. You know, we know that something like focal cerebral arteriopathy is much more common than a cardioembolic thrombus in a, in a kid. So knowing that, how does that change the approach to thrombectomy in pediatric patients versus the typical AFib, six-year-old AFib, not on anticoagulation with a uh, large vessel occlusion? How does the a priori knowledge of, you know, most of these kids with large vessel occlusion are potentially have an inflammatory etiology, how does that change your approach to these patients? Unfortunately, with pediatrics, it's uh, the, the challenge is multifold. Despite being brought into the hospital very, very early, uh, many cases within two hours, there are delay, incredible delays in the diagnosis of a stroke in a child to the point that you mentioned earlier. It's not the first thing that comes to mind. People think of like seizures, like physicians think of seizures and dehydration and other things. In one study, there was almost a 12.7 hour median time to diagnosing stroke with 50% of the diagnosis made after 24 hours after the child presented to the hospital. So that's probably part of the, like a major reason why many of the trials that have been done have not been successful because one of the lack of equipoise, but more importantly, it's a rare disease and the suspicion is very low. There's a, there's a very low index of suspicion of a stroke in a child. And when you actually diagnose it, the child's already 24 hours out in 50% of the cases. So there's a uh, major differences between our understanding of like a stroke in an adult and in a child. There's obviously the differences in stroke etiologies, 
There is also an immaturity of the coagulation system in children. The rarity of the, the diagnosis leads to delayed diagnosis. Different penumbral thresholds for children, like what, like our thresholds for penumbra in an adult has not really been validated for a child. So that number, those numbers are also very different. And there's also a lack of operator experience. Some people are just not like some interventionalists are not comfortable in many places. They're not necessarily fellowship trained interventionalists and they're not very comfortable doing a thrombectomy on a six year old or a seven year old. The guidelines are very, very limited. So finally in 2019, the American Heart and American Stroke Association issued a statement on the management of stroke in neonates and children, suggesting that consideration of endovascular thrombectomy and hyperacute therapies be limited to children with persistent neurologic deficits more than six NIHRS of six, radiographically confirmed large vessel occlusion, and those with large body habitus to size-based limitations of catheter, traversing cerebral artery arteries, and concerns for contrast dye and radiation exposure. This basically prompted us to take matters into our own hands. So we actually looked at, in a large population database, we decided that we're going to examine the National Inpatient Sample Database and try to identify outcomes of the children who actually did undergo thrombectomy, what exactly happened to them. So we actually were able to identify 7,000, almost more than 7,000 pediatric patients with ischemic strokes. And of those, 190 or 2.6% were treated with mechanical thrombectomy, which is a very, very low number. And the utilization basically differed, like increased significantly in the post endovascular clinical trial era, so after 2016. And ultimately, what we found was on an unadjusted analysis, 55% of EVT treated patients achieved fa favorable functional outcome as defined by discharge to home or discharge to acute rehab or home with some outpatient rehab. There were no procedural complications or instances of contrast induced injury reported like in the children who actually underwent thrombectomy. We also did a propensity match analysis and found that just comparing EVT to children who did not get EVT. And we also found that there was overall a significant benefit in performing mechanical thrombectomy than not. So this data, apart from the guidelines, would suggest that obviously on a case-by-case -case basis, but large data like this suggests that thrombectomy in children is you know, something that is ultimately quite beneficial. Yeah, no, exactly. The latest guidelines that came out was something that we worked on uh, recently looking at. This was a particular set of guidelines published to provide some guidance on patients in, within these special populations. And with regards to mechanical thrombectomy in neonates, infants, and, and children, we suggested that mechanical thrombectomy should not be withheld, but should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And we gave this a class 2AB level of evidence. One of the items that you had mentioned, the updated guidelines, specifically in kids with the large body habits, I'd like to kind of tease this out a little bit more. If you actually look, so if you look at two of the larger retrospective multinational data cohorts, the Kids Clot Study and the Save Child Study, these are both retrospective studies that each looked at multi, multi center sites throughout France, and the other one was maybe in Germany, but both of them kind of looked at on the order of 70 to 100 kids that presented for thrombectomy. And, and very interestingly, what they found is there is a large propensity of operators to take kids to thrombectomy with a particular selection bias against the variables that we know are very prevalent in kids. And, and just put another way, if you look at their data, most of the kids they were taking to thrombectomy had a median age of 11 or 12. And most of them have had etiologies of cardioembolic phenomenon. And we know that that is not the most common presentation of stroke in kids. We know that the median age of kids presenting with stroke is something like five or six, actually. And the most common etiology is an inflammatory etiology. So the problem with looking at these large retrospective multi-center studies is our operators taking kids to thrombectomy that quote unquote look like adults, i.e. they're taking older kids with cardioembolic phenomenon. And that's a problem because that's not what happens in real life. You have a younger kid who comes in with an inflammatory etiology. And I, I think you, you, you kind of mentioned it, you know, there is a, a real reluctance of operators to, to perform a thrombectomy on a five-year-old or a six-year-old. It's, it's just a very uncomfortable situation. And so I think it's, it is really important to recognize 
the importance of the statement, cases need to be evaluated on a case-by-case basis. And it almost seems like a cop-out, but it really is It really is the truth. So much so that some some authors suggest that actually the onus is to diagnose an etiology of the stroke before even considering a thrombectomy. But you and I know, both know, you know, practically speaking, to do a full inflammatory workup on a pediatric patient can take hours. And just practically speaking, you just can't wait. You just can't wait to have, you know, these results as you're selecting children for, for thrombectomy. Maybe let's talk a little bit about the techniques of thrombectomy in pediatric patients. Do you have any certain procedural techniques that you use in patients, say, less than five, less than six years old? What is your setup for stroke thrombectomies in, say, you know, smaller pediatric patients? Do you have a protocol for technique? I try my best. Obviously, I think a very important thing to talk about, especially in these younger children, is radiation exposure. The standard techniques for radiation dose minimization should be applied generally in in everyone, but especially in children for diagnostic and therapeutic applications of pediatric strokes. I would say I'm an aspiration first person, so I will always try to aspirate first. These are smaller human beings. Their vessels are definitely much smaller. Our devices, our guide catheters, our intermediate catheters could very frequently be too large for especially these neonates or like these very small children, uh, their vessels could be very, very small. You cannot put in a, like an eight French sheath in a, in a, in a five-year-old. Not infrequently, I found myself not using a, a sheath and using a five French guide or a six French guide as the sheath directly. Sometimes we can even use the intermediate catheters as the sheath. It's largely atraumatic. And if you're able to get access and advance it, it's very, very easy to track, and sometimes you can even get it all the way up to uh, where, where you need to get very, very easily. Luckily, it's a very rare occurrence, but when I both know, we've definitely, we, we definitely see these children, not infrequently. In my experience, I've just seen more posterior circulation, pediatric strokes than I've seen anterior circulation, whether it's due to vertebral artery dissections or, or not, I'm not sure. And in many of those cases, it's been luckily a single pass and things have gone well. But to the earlier point we were discussing, try and understand the etiology is very important, but we most frequently don't have the time, especially when we're, you're already dealing with a stroke that was diagnosed in a very delayed uh, fashion to begin with. Sure. I did recently look this up. The physiologic data and the anatomical data, by the age of six, a person's cerebral vasculature will have reached 94% of its ultimate diameter. So that personally for me is a cutoff. Past the age of six, I have no real hesitation of using a six French system in a pediatric stroke patient. So that really opens the gamut of the devices that we are all used to in adult patients. You know, a six French guide catheter, so, you know, a, a BMX or an infinity by the age of six, really, that that's a cutoff to me. The other cutoff that I try to keep in mind is uh, 15 kilograms. And the body interventional data suggests that less than 15 kilograms, you do have an increased rate of groin complications. So in those situations, less than six and less than 15 kilograms, I do try a fry French system, as you had mentioned, whether it's using an Envoy 5, you can kind of just go a stent retriever individually or, or even an aspiration catheter. And as we both know, the, the devices these days, especially with these three millimeter stent retrievers coming out and all these longer, low profile aspiration catheters specifically designed for medium vessel occlusions, the, the benefit of those are, despite the fact that they are so long, uh, you can definitely you know use those through a smaller profile system for aspiration first procedures. Pregnancy, pregnant patients who come in with large vessel occlusions, what is your approach for, for pregnant patients who present with a large vessel occlusion? Do you do anything differently? What is your overall approach to IV thrombolytics, large vessel occlusion, and thrombectomy in pregnant patients? Again, unfortunately, pregnancy was an exclusion in almost all of the thrombectomy trials and almost all of the thrombolysis trials. Luckily, pregnancy is also still relatively rare, but Females, during pregnancy, due to all the hormonal changes, there is a slightly higher risk than other females in that age group in particular. These are uh, much, much younger females, obviously, than the patients we treat for thrombectomy. But there is a slightly increased risk of thrombosis in those patients. 
The etiology of stroke, again, is very different here. I know a lot of people talk about, yes, you have kind of in this case, you have two patients. I still treat, like, I have one patient. I, I have to save my patient's life. I have to give her the best chance possible. So I will treat pretty aggressively. Luckily, many of these thrombectomies, many of these strokes occur in the last trimester in postpartum period. Again, these are adult patients. I treat them the way I, I would do any thrombectomy. And uh, again, unfortunately, I, I could not find a single study that was done, a single randomized control trial that included pregnant patients, which again prompted us to perform, to, like to again, take matters into our own hands and try to look at the data ourselves. And again, we found in a large population database that thrombectomy was largely safe and efficacious. With regards to TPA, TPA has not been approved for using pregnancy. To the best of my knowledge, I'd be more than happy to be corrected if I'm wrong, but I don't believe it's been FDA approved or cleared in pregnant patients. But for the most part, if you look at the data and if we go back to the basic sciences, basic science of these medications, the molecule, the alteplase molecule is just too large to cross the placenta. And there are no quality human or animal data documenting any teratogenicity of thrombolytic agents. The complication rates of TPA in pregnancy are comparable in some studies. They were done in and the results were actually comparable um, with a overall low risk of uh, maternal mortality. I think it was like 1%. Maternal high hemorrhage was around 8%. And fetal loss was around 6%, which is, again, in line with the risks that we give a non-pregnant adult receiving TPA. Do you have any higher proclivity to go radial on a pregnant patient to avoid use of thoroscopy uh, over the abdomen and pelvis? Just curious. That's a good question. I don't know. I think I, I probably would. At this point, for posterior circulation strokes, I have a very low threshold to go on radial. For anterior circulation strokes, I would say if it's a left common, I, I'd probably think twice. I, it's a little bit harder to select, and especially get your system up into the left common. The right ICA, I could definitely see myself considering it. Overall, I try my best to protect the mother and protect the baby. In many of these strokes, when they're occurring, it's occurring in the third trimester and after delivery. So it's less of a concern. Most of the organs have already developed and the risk of teratogenicity in, the, in these cases is lower. So again, I'll do everything I can to open up the blood vessel. And despite having adopted a radial and become more comfortable with radial access over the past like almost four years now, I'm still faster going femorally. And with a stroke, I, I just don't want to... Uh, uh, take any chances. So very similar. These patients are frequently managed on a case-by-case -case basis, and there is a very good reason for that. You know, the, the reason why we're having this discussion for everything that we just mentioned, you know, these are patient populations that were not involved in the, these randomized controlled trials. And obviously, you know, I've, I've never run a trial. I know, I know you have. You're running the conscious trial, which is a fantastic enterprise. There is definitely a desire on the PI's part to run a successful trial. And there's a reason to avoid these special populations when you're enrolling patients. So what are your thoughts on the entity of randomized controlled trials as it stands from a stroke thrombectomy standpoint? Yeah, we're, we're living in this era of evidence-based medicine, and that's fantastic. That's great. But as physicians, we find ourselves bombarded with a, a large number of trials and articles of which randomized controlled trials are considered the epitome in all terms of level of evidence. It's crucial to learn the, the skill of balancing knowledge of randomized controlled trials and the lack thereof and to avoid misinterpretation of trials in clinical practice and understand that in some particular cases, especially in some life-threatening circumstances, we may not have a randomized controlled trial. To your point, we'll never have a randomized controlled trial for pregnancy. We're never going to have a randomized control trial for pediatrics. We're never going to have a randomized control trial for individual developmental disabilities, for example. You're never going to have a randomized control trials for nonagenarians. It's just not going to happen. It's very, very hard to design a trial like that. I used to be very judgmental. As a resident, I'd read these trials. We'd have journal club. I'm like, but they include excluded these patients. And, and now I know why that this was done. The goal of a randomized controlled trial is basically to give us some data that it works in this particular case, in this particular circumstance. Now, it's up to us as clinicians to extrapolate that data 
and analyze it and try your best to understand the safety of this particular intervention and try to extrapolate that to other circumstances. I have a huge respect for investigators embarking on randomized control trials, having previously been very judgmental, questioning why a, me- a particular method was done. We know now that these trials were done for a very particular reason to prove that this intervention works in this particular scenario for this particular reason. And it's up to us to extrapolate the data to serve our patients that were included from these trials. Having currently served on multiple steering committees and multiple DSMBs and been involved in the design of trials as a principal investigator, I know it's very, very hard. And randomized controlled trials are recognized, although they're recognized to to exhibit high levels of evidence and represent a coveted position near the top of the evidence pyramid. But as clinicians, we should avoid the deification given to randomized control trials. There are limitations to randomized control trials, and we're not here to critique randomized control trials. Huge kudos to those who do them, and thank you very much. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be doing thrombectomies for anyone based on the last IMS-3 trial. But It's important to understand that not every disease is going to require or receive a randomized control trial. And I think that's very, very important to highlight. Thanks for raising this point, Krishna. And and very frequently, you know, clinical experience precedes randomized control trials. And one that both you and I are are exposed to is, um, you know, medium vessel occlusions, M2, A2, P2 occlusion. That is something that is encountered on a daily basis for which uh, randomized trial data does not exist. And Big kudos to Mayank Goyle for embarking on the Escape Mevo trial. But you're you're right. Certain entities will just never have randomized control data. And I think clinicians on a, on a daily grind basis, it's hard to recognize that and, and recognize how to proceed in very difficult clinical scenarios. You know, we're all trying to do the right thing out here, but it's it's sometimes it's very hard to do when you're facing terrible complications and facing judgmental views on why did you do that? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? There's no data for X, Y, Z. And it's hard, very challenging as a, as a clinician to sometimes garner personal support for your decisions on a daily basis, which is why I think it's important to talk about these special populations and what to do in these clinical scenarios on a, on a, on a daily basis. And for clinicians who are working in smaller community settings and not necessarily, you know, tertiary academic centers where there might be a little bit more of a cushion behind you to, to rest, to rest upon clinical decisions. Krishna, we were, uh, I think like earlier today, you and I were discussing why is it important to get involved in societies and be involved in what, what's the importance of taking the time to give a lecture at a small local library and why do people dedicate and volunteer their time to serve on clinical trials or even more importantly, serve on these guidelines committees. The reason I do it, as I'm talking to you right now, it it occurred to me, it's to have a seat at the table, to advocate for our patients. You will always have people who say, oh, but they're like, I I mean, I call them and a lot of people refer to them as the RCT mafia, where if there's no randomized controlled trial, it cannot make it into the guidelines. But we know that that can't be, and you're never going to have the guideline, the RCT to support that, which means that we're never going to be able to allow the physician in a local community hospital who knows the data, the natural history of a pregnant lady that comes in uh, with a stroke, but says, oh, well, those patients weren't really included in the randomized controlled trials. Maybe I shouldn't even offer a thrombectomy for this patient because technically she wasn't included, right? Or this child or this octogenarian or because the guidelines doesn't support that. That is why, like, I do that. I, like, I volunteer and so do you to have a seat at the table to advocate for our patients and make sure that their voices are heard. Thank you for that, Fawaz. You know, we, we certainly commend your, your hard work in the, in the research and academic sphere. Perhaps, you know, for the next session, we can kind of go into the ultimate of excluded populations, specifically large core infarction patients or patients who have come in with aspect scores of, say, you know, less than five, uh, less than four which is a, a very hot topic in the neurointerventional space right now with the results of these large core trials like Tesla and the SELECT-2 trial and the meta-analysis that was presented at ESOC in Germany of the three large core trials, uh, Angel Aspects, Rescue Japan, and SELECT-2, correct? Correct, yep. So, you know, we really appreciate having you, Fawaz. 
And I think this was a, uh, a fantastic session and hopefully the audience can use this on a, on a clinical daily uh, basis in their own practice. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It was a lot of fun. I'd like to put a plug in for the upcoming Society of Vascular and Eventual Neurology uh, meeting this coming November in Miami. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be a meeting unlike any other meeting you've attended. Uh, the theme of the meeting is innovation, and uh, we'll be discussing innovation in techniques, innovation in technology, innovation in implementation of this technology, and in way to make sure that we're not excluding any patients and making sure that these special populations are being very well taken care of. Fantastic, Foss. Can't wait to hear more about that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Louis Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 